The Seriously Free Speech Committee was formed to support Mordecai Greenberg, who's been sued by Ken West for conspiring to produce a parody of the Vancouver Sun. If you've read the writ, and indeed you can read it, it's on our website, it's very clear that this is a case of a corporate giant throwing its financial might around to try to intimidate and silence someone it views as an opponent. It's a classic slap suit. We do not all agree with Mordecai's politics. We don't advocate for any particular analysis of the contentious issues or solutions concerning Israel and Palestinian rights and practices. Rather, the Seriously Free Speech Committee is committed to an open and public discussion of these issues. It's fundamental to the functioning of our democratic society that we prize and protect our freedom to speak and discuss and debate freely. So we'll start Mordecai, please. Thank you. Fact number one, a slim four-page parody of the Vancouver Sun newspaper was published last June 2007. Parody, as you probably know, is a style of writing where you make a reference to something familiar, but you are trying to get the audience, whether it's a viewer or a listener or a reader, to take a different take on what is familiar. So you don't want them to mistake what you've identified as for the real thing. So you do a impersonation of Brian Mulroney or Jean Chrétien, you may do the accent, you may do the facial expressions to call up in the mind of the, uh, of the audience who you're referring to, but your comments are designed to make clear you're not exactly that person. You're viewing them from the outside rather than from the inside. And that's what this paper did, this parody did of the Vancouver Sun. A pile of the parodies were left on a table at a public meeting the evening of June 6th at the Vancouver Public Library. And that meeting was uh, called to mark and oppose 40 years of Israeli occupation of territories conquered in 1967. This was the first time I saw the parody. And after briefly scanning it, I picked up a small handful of copies and distributed them to computers in Burnaby, where I live, the next morning. I did so because it would stimulate them to think anew about the reliability of the information and commentary regularly published in the authentic Vancouver Sun. Six months later, in December, Canwest launched a legal suit in BC Supreme Court claiming the parody misused their trademark name and claiming that readers would mistake the parody <laughs> for the authentic commercial Vancouver Sun and finally that as a result of their un, uh, insensitive or incapacity to distinguish between the authentic and the parody, Canwest would suffer damages to their reputation, thinking the parody was really the Vancouver Sun. Well, so I guess we, uh, if we didn't know before tonight, uh, we found out that capitalism doesn't have a sense of humor. <laughs> Fact number two, the parody made fun of the Vancouver Sun precisely for its pro-Israeli reporting and commentary regularly produced in CanWest media at large. Not surprising, the founder of CanWest, Israel Asper, said in an interview in the Jerusalem Post in August 2003, quote, in all our newspapers we have a very pro-Israel position. We are the strongest supporter of Israel in Canada." End of quote. Why is CanWest so belligerent about a humorous parody of their newspaper? 
Why don't they laugh it off? and recognize the democratic right to satirical expression. What has devoured their sense of humor? Well, strange as it may seem, this Goliath of a corporation has weak self-confidence and fears even small voices like my own. And here is what I think, why, what I think they fear. Can West, as I have quoted from its founder, Israel Asper, is committed to defending Israel, right or wrong. But popular opinion about Israel is shifting away from this attitude. Despite all the pro-Israeli news reports, editorials, and commentaries, Despite praises from our present Prime Minister, more and more Canadians are uncomfortable with the policies and practices of the Government of Israel. The mood among many Jewish Canadians also is shifting from celebrating Israel to disenchantment and sometimes embarrassment. So even hurling slanders at former President Jimmy Carter and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, calling them anti-Semites, or as the popular phrase in those circles is now, near anti-Semites, <laughs> just seems ridiculous to more and more people. So, if you are put yourself in the shoes of Can West, what do you do when your media fails to keep people in the grasp of your framework? Well, I think what they do is they try to silence those whose only strength is not money or power, but information and arguments that they are afraid to publish and discuss openly. They attack with all their massive power the small voices who have minuscule financial resources. They hope that legal suits and bullying can scare away Canadians from thinking for themselves and publicly sharing their diverse thoughts on this contentious issue. They hope against hope that this bullying will stem the tide of a growing critical stand toward Israeli state policies and practices. In short, they act out of fear. Can West accused me and a printer, along with six others, of conspiring together to publish and distribute this parody. The uh, lawsuit was filed in early December, some six months after the forum, which was on June the 6th of 2007. And what Can West used to sue Mordecai was four torts or civil wrongs, claims for civil wrongs that you typically find in commercial law, in battles between uh, rival music producers or rival soft drink producers or enterprises of that nature. Uh, it's only rare that you find these commercial torts used in the non-commercial sector. Now, um, the first tort uh, or civil wrong, and the worst is the tort of conspiracy. It, it's been described by writers as having been developed as a judicial weapon. It doesn't find its origins in any statute passed by the democratic will, but it was developed by the courts. Uh, it's developed as a judicial weapon to check what was perceived to be socially dangerous activities by organized labor. Two of its most perverse features are these. 
First, once a party is proven to be a party to a conspiracy, evidence that would not normally be admissible against him or her is in fact admissible against him or her. Secondly, liability is joint and several. Instead of you having to pay damages only for your wrongdoings, in a conspiracy finding, you could be responsible for paying damages for what someone else has done. So damages are, the liability is joint and several. Damages may be awarded to the plaintiff who may then proceed against each or any of the defendants for damages. That's why in uh, the labor context, it's largely fallen into disuse. You don't often see it surfacing any longer because the outcry has been so severe in recent years. So uh, the elements of conspiracy, two or more people combining to act unlawfully with the predominant purpose of injuring the plaintiff or the defendants combining uh, to act unlawfully they direct their conduct towards the plaintiff and even though they don't intend to harm the plaintiff the likelihood of harm must be considered to be apparent to them so those are the basic elements of the tort of conspiracy it's a fairly low bar uh, that the plaintiff must establish evidentiary wise. Canwest lawyers stated they have no documents to support their accusation that I had anything to do with the creation and publishing and distribution of the parody, yet I am the central person they are accusing as responsible for creating, publishing, and distributing an undetermined number of the parody. It is not surprising Canwest cannot produce any documents demonstrating my involvement with the publishing of the parody because I had nothing whatsoever to do with imagining, writing, designing, financing, publishing, this parody. The second tort is uh, uh, an odd one. It's uh, injurious falsehood. The third is passing off, and I'll deal with the two together. Uh, injurious falsehood involves the publication of a statement about the plaintiff's property, and the statement's designed to induce the plaintiff, uh, induce others not to deal with the plaintiff. The statement must be false and it must be made with malice and it must result in special damages. Thirdly, passing off, the plaintiff possesses a substantial amount of goodwill involving a distinctive reputation for goods and services. There is misrepresentation on the part of the defendant that causes confusion or likely confusion on the part of the public and there is damage. So that's the third. The fourth is really not so much a tort as a violation of a statute, the Trademarks Act, and it's a false and misleading statement, the violation that they claim, um, made by a competitor that tends to discredit the business wares or services of a competitor. Those are the wrongs that are fiendish Mordecai Breenberg has been accused of. It was I who told Can West I distributed a handful of copies of the parody, which is my only involvement. It is my charter right, I believe, to do such distribution. I told Can West of this involvement because I believe in taking responsibility for what I do, the problem is, they want me to take responsibility for what I didn't do. There's, there's no question that uh, this is a slap suit, and we've seen a disturbing increase in the frequency of these suits in British Columbia and elsewhere in Canada in recent months. We have seen similar examples 
of uh, slap suits in um, the municipalities of Powell River and Nanaimo recently where uh, for the first time that I can recall in this province, municipalities are actively suing voters for criticizing uh, the politicians in the uh, management of the uh, voters' affairs as uh, members of that uh, municipality. Quite an extraordinary event. So all of those, including the case against Mordecai, in my view, constitute slap suits. Now, a slap suit is defined as a strategic lawsuit against public participation. That's the acronym. And it seeks to chill or punish a party's exercise of constitutional rights to free speech and to petition the courts and to use the courts for redress of this apparent grievance. The majority of the United States have anti-slap suit uh, legislation or rules that ban uh, this particular kind of litigation. If you are interested in reading more about uh, anti-slap suits, and I urge you to do, uh, the best single source of information is the California Anti-Slap Project. And if you Google that, you'll find uh, you'll get uh, access to that site and uh, it's wonderful. It has uh, the language from the California statute, the links to all of the other state statutes. So um, it's a very valuable uh, website and I urge you if you're at all interested in that topic to, uh, to have a look at it. Thank you. Because I am devoted to defending and enhancing a democratic culture, I have not changed my public expression of opinion or activities since this legal suit was launched against me. Since CanWest launched the suit, Since Ken Wentz launched the suit, I have been energetic in helping organize a public forum for the Jewish-Israeli historian Elan Pape, author of a very important book called The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. Since Ken West launched the suit, I've been energetic in helping publish a full-page ad in two Canadian papers with signatures of respected Canadians declaring, we cannot celebrate the 60th year of the founding of Israel. Since CanWest launched the suit, I've been enthusiastic in participating in a public demonstration solemnly marking the massive injustice of the 60th year of the dispossession of Palestinians from their lands, homes, and villages. And I have every intention of continuing this same work. Fear may be the emotion that prompts Can West's legal suit, but fear is no way to defend democratic culture. And my second comment, recognizing that you, like I, am confronted by a corporate giant with immense resources, great power, albeit declining authority, I believe, I want to observe that the more of us who involve our ourselves in defending a democratic culture, the less vulnerable any one of us is to vendettas. Like a bully in a schoolyard with one kid in his grip, when the other kids stand back, the bully feels emboldened and thirsts for more victims. A bully in a schoolyard with one kid in his grip and others approaching him, telling him to let go, feels disempowered and looks for a way out. Together, and only together, can we succeed. <laughs>